But you know who's really good at seeing you for who you are? Um, kids. Yeah, true. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was thinking you and other Anatomy Danielle Method practitioners, but yes, kids. Kids are better. Kids are, are natural, so seeing through the muck. And slowing down and connection, which is what we're going to talk about today, right? With my lovely friend, Phoebe, who's joining me all the way from Portland, Oregon, where she has a practice. Uh, she's an Annette Danielle Method practitioner, as well as a professional singer. Did I get that all right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. We wanted to chat a little bit about connection and how it's connected <laughs> to music <laughs> and how kids learn through music because you do such a fabulous job of using music to help access the potential of children's brains. Yeah. Thanks, Jen. Thanks for having me here. And it does feel a little awkward. We're recording a conversation, even though we talk all the time and we have these gl glorious conversations together and we don't record them, but here we are. We coming to you via recording so that you can have a little peek into our conversations and our ideas sharing. What Annette Benyel Method practitioners talk about in their spare time. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Business besties and, you know, practitioner besties and stuff. It's pretty, pretty special. Yes. Yeah. Connections. Connections, connections, connections. It's fascinating to me because my friend Jen Stewart who has the same training as I do, uh, doesn't have the same training as I do, is I have this other layer of training, which is music. And music has been like a part of my life since, since before I was born. My mom was always singing, whether it was singing songs to her dogs or, you know, making up songs for uh, my two older sisters or just singing around the house for pleasure, singing, making up songs, learning songs that she didn't know before, making up songs, understanding music. And that's been a, such a huge influence on my own life and my own parenting. Of course, I did all the, the routes to becoming a professional musician, but I started right from the cradle. Whenever you talk about your childhood like that, I'm always so jealous. I'm like, I wish I had that in my childhood because we didn't, like, it, music was not part of it yeah my dad told some really amazing jokes dad jokes but it was, <laughs> but there was no there's no music there yeah it just wasn't there yeah. yeah well dad jokes they do come in handy yeah they do and you you can find avenues for using them throughout your life too i'm sure yeah <laughs> making a career of dad jokes might i'm sure there's some people out there there are people out there making millions of dad jokes <laughs> so yeah then like played the violin throughout my childhood up till I graduated from high school and then I got transitioned more into being a singer and then I carried on did a couple degrees and it's just always been a part of my who I am I find it so connective when I'm working with children my own children and the children that I work with through my practice, my ABM neuro movement practice. And I must say that the most valuable lessons I learned in terms of using music with children were from those initial violin lessons. Ooh, like what, what do you mean? Well, I've been sort of analyzing how it is that I create music out of music I already know. And I'm sort of actually making this analogy to cooking, I think with you just like yesterday. We did too this yesterday and we didn't record it yeah exactly i was talking about making recipes either are you the kind of person who goes out and gets all of the specific ingredients for a recipe decides in advance to make a recipe and you have you need like three quarters of a pound of this and uh, half a pound of that and you need a 16 ounce can of tomatoes and you need these very specific things, or may perhaps they are in metric because you live in Canada, and, and then you go to follow the, the instructions very accurately, and then you end up with something that looks very much like the picture in the cookbook or on the, on the internet, and it's a huge success. Or are you the kind of person who goes out and gets like a, a rash of different things from different ingredients from the store that you like, the vegetables you like, the kind of protein that you like? Um, you have a pantry that's full of all the different kinds of baking goods and you have spices that are at your fingertips and you'll be able to make whatever you want when you when inspiration inspires you. So I'm of the latter cooking 
um, yeah. method. I don't know about you, but when well, I was going to say who cooks, but <laughs> when I actually do cook, that is how I cook. Yeah, whatever is in the fridge. I have no foresight. You know, no planning. Yeah. But you have a lot of information about how to whip together something. Yeah. Right. And if you were trying to make something new, maybe you would you would follow the instructions of some let's be, say you wanted to make macaron or something like that like my daughter did the other day she was making those amazing almond cookies that have amazing buttercream icing inside them i had no idea how you made buttercream icing before she made them and unfortunately both times she made these macarons you know what they are cookie yes fortunately unfortunately the recipe for the buttercream icing that my daughter made is like twice as much as you actually need so that and she made the recipe twice in the past little bit. So there's like a ridiculous amount of icing in my fridge that I keep having to taste. So, I was going to say, so what are you making for supper with your with your buttercream icing? <laughs> How are yeah. you going to fold that into your supper? Yeah, maybe not. No. Uh, it's just, it's it's for that late night little taster. So where was I going with this? Oh yeah, having the resources to be able to make the resources of understanding of how different vegetables cook or how how you prepare this or that, that you can kind of swap your knowledge about this and into this other situation. You kind of have a, a working knowledge of, of cooking and therefore you can make anything and you can warm up anything. You have a huge range of things you can do. So when I think back to my really early days of music learning, I learned uh, using the Suzuki method, which okay. uh, was a early childhood learning method that re relied on ear, your ear to be able to hear what it is you're doing. And it actually relied on a lot of sort of repurposing of music. And the very one of the very first songs you learn to play on the violin, or you know, maybe it's the cello, or maybe it's the piano, or maybe it's another instrument that's also part of the Suzuki method is Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. But you never start with the basic Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star like you might sing it. You start with variations on Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. And there's like seven different variations on Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. And before you get to play the final, which it sounds very much like how you would sing the song Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. So I've been playing a lot with that these days because I keep making up new songs, figuring out how to use the tune of Twinkle Twinkle Little Star in all its variants to put in all sorts of different words to make interesting new songs on, on what I already know. Just like pulling up a, re pull, not making having a recipe, but making your own recipe out of the information that you already have. Which is exactly what like we do as ABM practitioners, right? Like that's, we're given, well, I call it like a toolkit when I'm talking to parents, because parents can also have these same tools in their toolkit. And uh, so we have these basic movements and these basic concepts and theories. And the more ingredients you have, the more complex movements you can create and you can help your child create. Yeah. That's why, it's fine, it's fine. Well, that's why it is very hard to teach linearly, right? Well, one, because we don't learn that way and kids don't learn that way. But it's also, yeah, it's a collection of these experiences and these ingredients that make the goodness. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And your secret ingredient ingredient might be very different than my secret ingredient that makes the dish taste. Yeah. So true. Tailored for the person. Tailored for the person who's right in front of you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm noticing so much. Like when I, when I did uh, the training, I kept thinking back to when we're learning about the essentials for brain change or to wake up the brain to new possibilities or also known as the nine essentials of a not benial method neuro movement, I kept thinking like, I know this one. I, I know about slow. I know about gentle. I know about variation. I know about paying attention to what you're doing, movement of attention. I know all these things, even imagination, because I learned about them in my music lessons. But having, having a a construct, an another way of thinking about it through the body, suddenly those those ideas, those things that I learned came alive in a new kind of way. And then I've moved back. And now that I've been a practitioner for a while to be like, okay, so we can learn about those essentials, seeing it through the lens of music. And then we can, once we've learned about it through movement in our training, 
and in life. But once we learn about it through music, say, we can then maybe repurpose that into a movement pattern or into a movement understanding. So I was really kind of excited to meld these two aspects of my life and understandings of my expertise to hopefully reach a, a broader audience of people who want more support in their parenting, either their little tiny babies or their toddlers or children of any age and stage. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate that view. Like we all become better parents and all become better practitioners when we uh, have more than one viewpoint, right? When we're introduced to somebody else's viewpoint. And I really appreciate that concept of music uh, or from a music viewpoint and your viewpoint specifically, because it's a viewpoint I would never have thought of. I guess it's not something that I grew up with, right? And it's like, oh my goodness, yeah, of course, that makes total sense. So yeah, it's like adding little uh, little spaces to my toolkit. Now, I'm, I know I'm not going to be an expert in music, but I can add the little spice pieces, right? I, you know, I can remember Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, and I can play around with it. Yeah, You already know different versions of, different variations on Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. Right. You already know them because the alphabet song is the same tune as Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. And Baba Black Sheep is also Twinkle what? Twinkle Little Star. I know. So you already know three versions of that tune. And what you'll notice is that what makes them seem different is the words, but also the rhythm of how the words lay on the different notes, how they're how they're scanned on the notes. Okay. So if we have twinkle twinkle little star so that's basically even number of words to notes yeah and they're they're eighth notes but i don't need to get into technicalities with you i'm trying to figure out a way to explain it so that it doesn't sound like it's you have to know another language in order to understand it but if you look at that ba ba black sheep have you any wool right it, you have twice as many twice as many words within the same amount of time. So they're more like 16th notes. And then it, it's true for, for the ABC song as well, that the, the scanning of the tune with the scanning of the words is different. So you already know variations on it. And I've been playing around with variations on the ABC song in order to eliminate the problems of of kids thinking there's extra words in the, there's extra letters in the alphabet, like. L M N O P. L M N O P. That's one word. It's one letter. Or it's a letter, you know, L M N O P. So in my in one of the versions that I thought of, it it goes something like A B C D E F G H I J K L M N O P Q R S T U V W X Y Z that's the end or something like that. I mean actually that was a version I have never made up before. Oh that but was see that it's like um something that you can because I've been playing around with numbers and you yeah. know how to do counting with twinkle twinkle little star song and of course it's repurposed from something else right it's repurposed from a mozart song which is repurposed from a previous from a, a even farther back like folk kind of song it's like total repurposing all the time which is what exactly what we have to do as practitioners but also as parents repurposing all our knowledge and our capacity to connect with our kids in different ways right yeah that that like you're you're gathering up all these tools and repurposing things using variation for the end goal to connect to your child and for your child to connect to themselves so one thing about music that is like so connective is that um i think we were talking about music like as a conversation at one point and how it was not something you had thought of no, yeah, I remember that kind of light bulb moment. I always thought of music as one person singing to another person. Yeah, 
like a disconnect, right? You know, um, but yeah, it's more like a conversation. Well, as yeah. you've taught it, as you've taught me, <laughs> it's more like a yeah. conversation. When it's not a conversation is when it's like a one-way conversation. When it's on YouTube, say, or when you're listening on a uh, a recorded, if you're listening to a recording. You don't have the chance to interact with it in the way that you would if you make homemade music. If you're making music for with your child and for your child, when you do that, you have all the time in the world to go to do it just so it connects with your child. So you've got the speed and the volume and the capacity to change anything, add your child's name, um, make it about a, a subject that they're interested in. And the sounds that the kids like is so interesting. It's so unique, right? And you can really connect with them using that funny noise that they like or that person's name that they like. Yeah, that's right. And and incorporate what they say. And uh, even if it's not a, a word that, that is understandable as a as a distinctive word, they can be a part of the making and creating of the music with you. And maybe you allow for a whole, a whole, like you stop in anticipation of them participating in the song. So if you are singing the alphabet song, you could just wait for a little bit and then they can insert the next letter that they re remember from another time that they heard it being sung or yeah, that it ends up being a collaborator, a collaborative event a collaborative thing that you're putting together. Uh, maybe they're contributing by uh, using a little bit of a percussion instrument or something like that. They're shaking something or they are uh, participating in a way that's not, I don't know, it doesn't need to be perfect. It's like any other, con like any conversation. I do a lot of like hitting, hitting the table with hands and feet or themselves, right? You can make that's right. beats and noises. Because the music, music isn't just, so just it isn't just melody right it's rhythm it's dynamics it's, it's length it's, it's volume it's speed sometimes if you're it's a song it's words it's articulation like if i was talking to you like this you could see understand that that's a musical that's like a kind of articulation but if you were talking like this is in all one long legato way so if you're looking at music they have different markings or music in in a score that indicate the kind of articulation you are so are, are the composer intended for you to explore. It's just like a just a huge like a suitcase of possibilities of uh, a toolkit a tool it's but tools imply some kind of like fixing. So we're not going to go with toolkit. We're going to go with like like uh, opportunities or what is the right kind of, word? do we have kind of like light but yeah. And music too, you have that like those different levels of uh, so like when you're physically moving, you're you're having all sorts of different sensory incoming information coming in, like your sense of um, you know your kinesthetic sense, your uh, vestibular sense, your you know the sense of your your feeling yourself where you are. You can incorporate a lot of this different senses when you're making music or playing around with music, right? Like the beats and the rhythm things and the, the different tones of listening and hearing and making, producing, where your tongue goes. It also has the capacity to express emotions and working on an emotional level, right? Um, I mean, there's all sorts of different kinds of music. There's the kind of music that like pumps you up, gets you excited, gets you dancing, gets you like moving and grooving or uh, really jazzed about something. And then there's like lullabies. They're intended to calm down your nervous system, get you ready for going to sleep. And there's like, we experience as adults, we you know have music or sound qualities that show up when people do meditations or look for some kind of reflective opportunity to, to consider their thoughts or just go deeper internally to figure out who they are you can do that of course through movement which is like our whole training you can go into that like internal meditation by moving but you can also do that by through listening listening to music and um, exploring who you are in that fashion too yeah i well, think it's pretty powerful that is pretty cool that's a different dynamic that i never thought of right 
or never made the connection. Yeah, I think music. So there are other, there are animals that that produce music. I mean, there's birds that create songs, and there's there, there's actually insects that like they crickets or uh, buzzing this and that, and things we can't even perceive. Of course, there's like coyotes and wolves that howl, and they and they howl for enjoyment and also connection. They're looking for other wolves or coyotes to communicate connect communicate and connect yeah but it's a pretty primal human trait to communicate and to use song or music or rhythm or all the variations on what music can be to tell stories yeah stories right yeah to pass along like history to pass along information um, you know that you know that it's that music is so powerful when when you're at when you're at the library before the internet and you're like trying to figure out what the alphabetical order is and you're like l m n o p just using that exact same example like which one comes first in the alphabet how am i going to find this on the shelf because you've learned this piece of information through a song and you can recall it and dig that out of your memory bank through the song yeah. yeah, I definitely saw that with uh, with my daughter, Sarah, some of the uh, number songs. She had really tough, I, um, hard time with the concept of numbers. And that's how she learned how to count. That's how she learned how to say yes and no was through a song. And just that, and yeah, the putting a rhythm to it, I, get, I think. Maybe it's just not quite as recognized in general. People don't think, oh, I learned through music. But if we learn through rhythm or dynamics or... And it's not it's not through repetition. This is one thing I would I would if I were to go back into my you know early childhood music education and my concept of what it was I was doing in order to learn something and my my concept or what I was taught at that time is is about repeating it until you know it. But from our near movement training, I look back on that now and I think it wasn't repetition. It would have been much more valuable to me and it's way more valuable to me now as I'm when I'm learning music to realize that it's it's just another iteration and each iteration that you do it is going to have some variation and the more times you the more iterations you make of it because we can never repeat it because we're not machines the more iterations you make the more you're going to know about it yeah and that works in a physical realm and it works because music making is a physical thing you're playing around with the approximations of that thing that you're trying to learn or that song that you're trying to learn. Iterations, approximations. I used to uh, have to memorize a lot of music and a lot of words for performing. Uh, I don't do this much now because I'm more doing this than I'm doing singing or playing actually. And you have to figure out how to memorize. I had to figure out how to memorize words, especially figuring out for me just all the the little tricks of whether whether the words came if it was a list of words say I'm thinking of a very specific song which lists all of the elements the natural elements in the world it was almost impossible to memorize because it wasn't a story to me because I'm not a chemist though I, some of them I'm like okay so the I was thinking in my head they would go in an alphabetical order. A little chunk of words would go in an alphabetical order by their first, by the first in, letter in the name. Yeah. And other times, like, has to do with it rhyming with something else. That's another thing that music provides is is rhyme and sentence structure and poetic structure and um, learning about rhythm in in that way too. It's like not just necessarily learning about the music of language and how our language incorporates a lot of elements of music. Anyway, that one song I was just referring to starts out because I can't sing the whole thing, but I can sing a little bit of it, but it goes something like, there's antimony, arsenic, aluminum, selenium, and hydrogen, and oxygen, and nitrogen, and rhenium, rhenium, and nickel, neodymium, neptunium, neodymium, and anyway, anyway, it's like impossible to remember, and you're supposed to sing it like super yeah. fast so that it has that little flow of of funniness that it's just spilling out all these words. Anyway, that's apropos of nothing, I think. But there you go. But how your brain 
like figured out how to memorize it or how to learn it. I shouldn't say memorize. At the time. Yeah. I did I did memorize it. But there was sometimes when I had to go and actually it made it quite funny where I'm like had to slow it way down to remember what was coming next. And I remember doing a a, a rehearsal performance of it and being like, and this one comes next. Yes, this one comes next kind of thing. <laughs> like, oh, there's the power of slow. I can access the information that I did put in there at one point. I just can't get it out fast enough to perform the thing all super, super slick and super quickly at this time until I get more but you can with slow it down. Slow yeah. it down. And you see that with the kids all the time. Right. Like quite often they might actually know the movement or the word or the skill. Uh, you just, we just don't give them enough time to do it. <laughs> accessing, accessing. Yeah. Hey, back to like, I think there is a huge distinction between memorizing something and learning something. And I think you know, our education system leans a little bit too heavy on memorizing, for sure. I know in university, I definitely memorized things that I will never recall <laughs> ever again, because I did not learn it. I just memorized it. And I think that's true, like with movement as well, and how some therapies are trying to have the child memorize a movement through repetition, which is very different than learning the movement. Yeah, really very different. Yeah, I've been thinking, uh, I know we weren't gonna talk about this, but I have been thinking about learning loss um, and how like teachers and parents are worried about the, the learning loss that might happen over the, the summertime, just because we're going back to school right now, it's September and, and our kids are back in school. So is that just memory loss? So it's that memory loss. But then I started thinking about how as adults, and this is going a different direction than what we talked about yesterday that wasn't recorded. Uh, adults have a learning loss of learning how to play. Yeah. yeah. And learning how to explore. Yeah. And uh, kids have that in spades or should. If we're allowed to say should about anything, I think it's about kids should learn how to play or be able to play or have big, big areas of play in their lives because that's the experimentation and that's the going out and picking up little pieces of information, getting getting all the ingredients for, from which they can then make other things. Yes. This is going right back to cooking in the kitchen. Nice okay. circle back. Way to circle back. And there's a difference between like the ingredients being memorized versus the ingredients being learned. Yeah. yeah. And yesterday we were talking about it, it being an embodied experience. The things that we don't forget, like uh, even after five years of not riding a bike, if you had a bike and you put your, your leg over and you sat on the seat and you had your hands on the handlebars, if you knew how to ride before, you're going to know how to balance. Unless you've had some kind of catastrophic event in the meantime, in which uh, you've had to relearn how to do things like balance. Yeah. You know, your equilibrium is all kind of um, not the way it was before. Uh, then, yes, you probably need to learn again. But if everything has been pretty much on track, you, you don't have to spend much time relearning how to ride a bike, even if it took you a long time to begin oh. with. Yeah. Yeah, that reminds me of uh, two two winters ago, I got back on skis for the first time in like 20 years. And it was, I thought I was going to be a total disaster. <laughs> I thought it was going to be like riding the bike, a bike for the first time. And it was amazing how like Im embodied that process was. And now that I know what I know, also how when I consciously thought of trying to ski better, it was just a disaster. But when I just flowed with it, and just let it let it naturally occur and have fun and be playful, how much faster I, you know, regained the skill sort of thing. Yeah, it was fascinating as an adult to go back to something. Yeah, everyone should do that. Go back to something. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Try it again. Do it again. So that brings me around, but uh, in in this spiral we're working on here, um, that the word, the verb that we use to describe the act of music making is to play. Right. Yeah. You play music, and you play music even when you're listening to music on a recording. You press play in order for it to be the vibrations that are happening that your ear is interpreting as music, the sound that you're hearing. And I just love... You're not, you're not forcing music or you're not uh, repeating music and you're not, uh, yeah, memorizing music. You're playing music. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and until you get to a certain level of, if you're a professional, until you get to a certain level of it, you don't realize that when you're performing music, you are still in a play situation. Right, right. You kind of have to get to a certain level where you're not just trying to re recreate what you did in the practice room when you're filling in, when you're trying to get all the pieces together so that it ends up being uh, a product or an experience that you think is worthy of other people listening to, but that you get to a place of like creating in the moment with the other people who are with you, hopefully, or even if you're by yourself, you're like, have the capacity to add creativity or do things, perform it in a way that's uniquely creative to that very moment um, and intentionally. Yeah. Intentionally doing that. Uh, you're consciously doing it. Yeah. 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 That you don't really get to that until you, I don't know, have some kind of epiphany or are so. Uh, and that's what makes like the, you can you can hear the difference in somebody repeating music versus they're at a different level and they're, they, they know they have all the ingredients and now they can play the music, you know, and you can probably hear the difference quite well. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also when you, when you're performing, you are in relationship with, it's a kind of a one way relationship and yet it's not, if you're performing, just like if you're in a, I don't know, a job interview or something like that. And everybody's sitting at the table like this, like prove yourself. And like, oh, why should we even choose you? Why should I listen to you? Why should I hire you? Whatever. Compared to like having an audience where you know, you can feel their their vibration. That is like, we believe in you. We can't wait to hear what you have to offer us. We are in connection with you. Um, and then th those are the kind of, audiences where at the end nobody claps and it's like because everyone's holding this gorgeous space of we just experienced this all together like all the people who are on stage all the people in the audience have had this like amazing experience of of wonder in the room of the vibrations that everybody has it's just so magical when that happens and the first people are like the first people to clap I'm usually like, oh, don't clap because this moment of of kind of nothingness and this total connection between everybody in the space is so magical and precious. And then the other thing. Yeah, circling back to ABM, obviously that that it's a direct correlation to uh, the child that does something fantastically brand new and the room is totally quiet and who, as soon as somebody yells, oh, you did it, you, it, it shatters the moment and it takes the child out of that space um, of, of something that they created on their own. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was not performative, but it was new and fresh and like encapsulated something that meant advancement or meant, connection or something like that it can yeah. be just so yeah powerful you can hardly breathe yeah yeah and th those are the spaces that you're creating as a practitioner with the kids you know and th that's the type of space that you want to recreate and parents can do it too at home right i have uh athletic kids <gasps> who yeah. don't don't um take music lessons necessarily they're definitely exposed to music a lot but they don't take formal lessons especially right now well at least two-thirds of them don't and they do more sporting things and I'm starting to see lots of connections about how sporting and athletics has elements of of, of, of layering of 
of concepts like these. And, I, I, and because I'm not an expert, I I can't really speak to it, but I'm starting to see how like how powerful it is to just study something and then see how uh, neuro movement, ABM, and up neural method could enhance that experience or that you uh, see like patterns that are the same because it's all about how the brain works. But I mean, the ABM neuro movement is all about how the brain works and how humans are put together and and make sense out of the nonsense of of the world or whatever. Anyway, my my brain's being expanded by the fact that I have children who do different things than things and, that I know about. And how related it is, yeah. Well, you just related cooking to singing to ABM, so why not sports and athletics? But that's actually how I got one mom to kind of uh, grasp that concept, not grasp me a concept, but how, if, if you've ever done athletics, what you've experienced, you just told me a story about uh, this magical moment that you've obviously experienced because you could see it in your face and how you described it. That magical moment of like a flow, we'll just call it flow, right? And most people who have done some sort of athletics has has felt that like flow in their body where everything's just is your whole body flows and everything's connected you kind of can do no wrong you're in you know you're in the moment instant by instance you're really like you're embodied in the moment um, and that feeling that feeling how many times does your child experience that and that is what you want your child to experience in their therapy and how many therapies allow your child to experience that or yeah. even consider it or even consider, yeah, as a possibility, yeah. Because like that is when you're at your best of your, like your human essence is at your best when you're in that like flow state. Here we are. Here we are, flowing. <laughs> flowing and cooking. So if I'm gonna say like one last thing about how you could use music with your child, I want you to remember that it can be so super simple because music especially singing it's kind of like elongated speech and it allows for the capacity to slow down if you have a problem slowing down like sometimes i do because i like to go quickly of course uh if you have problems with slowing down singing something like this or like that it doesn't have to be like a fully formed song with you know uh, a verse and a chorus and then another verse and chorus or or something that you've heard before like a simple song like twinkle twinkle little star it doesn't have to fit into a framework that exists but singing can be a way to notice your volume your speed your gentleness your you can use your imagination you can uh, start to see what kind of reaction your child might have you can go as slowly as you want and as slowly as your child needs, because that can be the, that is actually, this is one of the pitfalls I found with it, like using an existing song and putting different words to it is that I kind of want to just complete the song and I want to get to the, to the, to the next bit faster than is necessary or is, is uh, optimal for your child that you can stop anywhere. You can go slower. You can articulate it in a different way. But making it as simple as possible is, and as easy for you to do it, that's what is the best for you. And that's what I want for you is to feel free to make it as simple as possible and use the advantages of all of the elements of music that are going to light up your child's brain uh, through the lens of music so that change happens and connection happens. And it can be as simple as that. Right. You're just creating these small little pockets during your every day of connect, slowing down and connecting. And you can do that through movement or through song and just elongating a word. That's right. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Phoebe. Thank you for coming and chatting with me all about connection and music and your movement. Right. I will put all of Phoebe's links of how to contact her down below. Thanks for sharing your brain. It's a potluck. A potluck of brains. <laughs> okay.
Okay, thanks for hanging out with us. See you next time. See you next time. See you then. See you then. Can't wait till I see you again. Bye-bye.